Okay, uh, good morning everybody. Um, I think we can go ahead and get started. It's 10 o'clock now. So um, thank you all for joining us uh, for today's Water Conservation Showcase. This is the 15th annual Water Conservation Showcase, which is pretty impressive. Uh, I'm Ross Ferris. I'll be hosting the session today. I'm with uh, Frank Booth, Design Build Contractors. I'm also wearing my AIA Committee on the Environment hat today. Um, just a couple of quick announcements before we get started. We want to thank all of our co-organizers who've worked very hard to put on this, present or this entire showcase uh, today. Uh, so that consists of U.S. Green Building Council, uh, East Bay Municipal Utility District, San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, uh, AIA Committee on the Environment, and of course PG&E Pacific Energy Center. Um, we, as, as you probably noticed, we do not have any printed handout materials. All the slides uh, and the recordings of the sessions will be available on the website waterconservationshowcase.com. Um, it probably in a couple weeks, first week of April, something like that, so you can check back there. Uh, if you do need continuing education credits, uh, slides three and four will show the numbers for these sessions, one for USGBC, another for AIA. Again, you can also get that information off of the websites once the slides are posted to the website. Um, there are door prizes going on today, so if you are trying to win something special, uh, if you have your passport, you can go around to all of the different vendors that are out there. We have vendors on the first and second floor, uh, so make sure to get your stamps for that and you can turn in your card uh, at the front desk downstairs. Um, restrooms. One is right outside the door here and off to the right. Another downstairs just at the bottom of the yellow stairs. Uh, more importantly, fire exits. So the exit from this room, the best thing to do is just exit right out through this way. You'll go down the hallway, down the stairs, and it takes you directly out to the front of the building. Uh, from there, our reconvening location would be at the carousel over at 4th Street. So that's where we will reconvene in the event of an emergency. Uh, there are water dispensers available you know, throughout the building. Uh, and then obviously lunch, something very important for everybody, lunch is provided today. So if you're able to stick around for that, please do. Uh, it'll be available from 1130 to 1230 in the HVAC classroom, which is on this floor, just kind of in the back corner of the building there. There's signs posted for that. There's some table seating in there available. There's also a room that's kind of directly behind us here uh, with some extra overflow seating. There's a hallway off to the side that you can get to the room back there. There's signage out front for that as well. And if you have any questions about any of that, you can just ask anybody with a badge on. Um, so with that, I'd like to just also remind everybody, please uh, silence your cell phones. We will be holding questions until the end. Uh, and as I said, all the sessions are being recorded today, so it's really important that to get your question heard. We need to um, have it spoken through the microphone. So after our speakers are done with their presentations, I'll be running around uh, with the microphone to get questions. So um, with that, I'd like to introduce our speakers today, if I could turn the page. Uh, so we've got Erica Ross with PAE, uh, an associate uh, with PAE Engineers. Her primary focus is on water efficient plumbing designs for sustainable buildings. She's designed over a dozen lead rated and registered projects and she has provided, she's a provider of expertise for a wide variety of on-site water reuse systems including rainwater, gray water, and black water systems. Uh, and we also have Eric Howe from Natural, Inter Natural Systems Utilities. Uh, he has over 10 years of experience in the design, construction, commissioning, and operation of water and wastewater systems. Uh, he has a background in environmental design, I'm sorry, environmental engineering and is responsible for the successful delivery of over 50 water systems uh, with design capacities ranging from 5,000 to 8 million gallons per day. Uh, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Erica first. Can everyone hear me okay? Hi, my name's Erica and I'm extremely excited to be here today to talk to you about the water systems in the Bullet Center. The Bullet Center is the world's first and largest uh, commercial office building to receive the living building certification. It was able to achieve this by producing uh, net positive energy and net zero water. This presentation is going to go through the three water systems uh, that make this possible. Before I get into all of that, 
I'd like to give you a little bit of history about my company. I am a plumbing engineer and associate at PAE Engineers. PAE is a MEP consulting firm that has, we just celebrated our 50 year anniversary last year. And throughout PAE's history, sustainability has always been the core of who we are. We have designed uh, six living buildings and 36 LEED Platinum buildings. And the build Bullet Center is kind of the quintessential PAE project. It's what we strive to do. It is a six-story office building that's roughly 50,000 square feet. And the building opened on Earth Day in 2013. On this slide, we have a few of the awards that this building has won, and this is just a small sampling of it. We have won a number of awards since this building has opened. It is located in Seattle, Washington, specifically in the Capitol Hill area. And uh, as most of you know, Seattle has a very high rainfall rate and is a great candidate for rainwater collection and treatment and reuse and that is utilized on this project. I'd like to talk a little bit about the owner of this project. An owner is always one of the most important members of a design team. They can be the guiding force behind that project. They set the goals and can really be the passion in the project. For this, for the Bullet Center, we were fortunate enough that the owner is the Bullet Foundation. They are a nonprofit organization, and the president is Dennis Hayes, who founded Earth Day, and he was selected uh, as New York Times Heroes of the Planet. It's an extremely unique opportunity to be able to work with an owner like this, where they're not just emphasizing sustainability, they are requiring it for their project. The Bullet Foundation's goal for the Bullet Center was to create a building that would set the new bar for sustainable buildings. And in the last five years, the Bullet Center has done just that by producing 30% more energy than it uses on site annually and by using 85% less water than a typical office building. And that's before even considering the on site treatment systems. This is the rest of the design team. The architect was Mo Miller Hull, who is a sustainability leader. And as I mentioned, PAE did the MEP design of the building. And for all of the water systems we're going to go over here today, we worked in collaboration with 2020 Engineering. And I think an interesting tidbit of the project team is that both the Bullet Foundation and PAE are current tenants of the Bullet Center right now. The Bullet Center is an extremely innovative building. It is a pilot program or pilot project in Seattle and just a sustainability leader. Every system within that building contributes to its success. And each one of the, these systems on the screen right here could have its own presentation. But we are at a water conservation showcase and I am a plumbing engineer. So this presentation is going to focus on the three water systems within the building. Whenever you're designing a water system for a building like this that's trying to achieve net zero water, you have to think about it in a completely different way. On a traditional building, it's water in, water out, and you're trying to potentially reduce the amount of water used within the building, but you're not looking to collect and reuse it. But for a net zero water building, you think of it in a different way. You're trying to see what you can collect on site, to then reuse within the building. So you're first reducing your water use and then evaluating the different systems and how you can separate those waste streams to then collect and reuse on site. And there's many different ways and systems that you can use to achieve this goal and you just have to evaluate what makes sense for your project based off of the project goals, the location of the project, the project type, and the space available to you. For the Bullet Center, we evaluated a number of different system types in the beginning of the project. And since it was trying to achieve a, a living building certification, energy was a big factor. And so the first system that was selected was the composting toilet system. And this was selected over a typical on-site MBR system or constructed wetland because it has such a low uh, energy use and a very small footprint. The second system 
is a gray water treatment system. And this is used purely for groundwater recharge and is not used for any reuse in the building because there is such a low non-potable water demand within the building. And then the last system is collecting rainwater for potable water reuse on site. And we're able to collect enough to meet the total building's demand for the entire year. The first system we'll focus on is the composting toilet system. And the Bullet Center is the tallest building to implement a composting toilet system at six levels high. The system consists of composting or foam flush composting toilets, waterless urinals, waterless urinals, uh, and then aero aerobic composters in the basement, and then leachate tanks. The way the system works is that the waste is collected from each composting toilet separately and routed directly to the composters in the basement. This is pretty significantly different than a typical plumbing system where you would have one main pipe that all of the water closets or toilets are collected on each floor and connected to that main pipe. But since you have to route them separately, each water closet has a separate pipe going down to that composter, and so you have a lot more pipe in the building. We ended up having about 800 linear feet of piping within the plumbing chase. Once the, the waste enters the composter, it is mixed with wood chips, and the aerobic composting process begins. And it takes about 18 to 24 months for the whole composting process to be complete, and it turns into dry, odorless compost that is then removed from the machine, and it is taken to the final processing off-site, where it's he heated to a higher temperature and reused as fertilizer um, for local plants. Then any excess liquid within the composters, which is considered leachate, is pumped out of the composters and stored in four leachate tanks located in the basement. These tanks are periodically pumped out and emptied through a pumper truck, and that leachate is taken to an off-site facility where it is fully treated and reused on wetlands. I assume the majority of people here have not seen a composting toilet system in an office building. And thankfully, it is pretty different than any composting toilets you've seen in a park or on a campsite. First of all, first of all and arguably most importantly, it, there is no odor. And as you can see, these fixtures look very similar to a tank type water closet that you would see in an office building. But the big significant difference here is that instead of using up to 1.6 gallons per flush every time this toilet is used, it only uses two tablespoons of water that mixes with a biodegradable soap to form a foam that coats the bowl. This is an image of the composters located in the basement. We have 10 aerobic composters, and they're roughly three and a half feet by five feet wide and about seven feet tall. And there is regular maintenance required for these machines, but we have received great feedback from our maintenance staff that it's pretty hassle-free. And most of the maintenance staff would prefer to maintain th these equipment instead of cleaning the filter for a gray water system. The maintenance required is adding wood chips at the top slot of the composters here uh, once a week, and then three times a week you have to move the compost and stir it up. And that's done by, there's a wrench on the, the middle composter you can see. You connect that wrench to it and you just turn it. You don't have to open up the composters for that. And then after the 18 to 24 month period, compost is or created, and it is this clean, odor-free, dry compost, and the Bullet Center is able to create about 90 gallons of compost every year. Through maintaining this system for the last five years, we have learned a number of very valuable lessons learned. The first one was during the design phase, and it was it's regards to the fact that each water closet requires a separate pipe routing down to the um, composters, and that in large needs a larger plumbing chase to be coordinated. As you can see in this upper right hand corner, by level one you have a lot of pipe in that one plumbing chase, and if you don't coordinate that with the architect early on, it's a 
big hassle and has a lot of conflicts with it. So if you can get that coordinated early on and design your plumbing chase accordingly, the system can work a lot better. Second is kind of an overarching lessons learned as for that anytime you can specify equipment, you want to specify equipment that's designed specifically, specifically for your application. In our case, we didn't necessarily have that luxury and because it hadn't been used in an office environment before. And so this system is really designed for um, a park or a campsite where you have about five fixtures routed within the system. And so we have found, we've encountered a few issues with it where it's just not operating at optimally of how we were anticipating. The first way is that you're not able to evenly distribute the load, which is pretty important. Um, since you have dedicated toilets routed to a composter, we have two floors that are, have a higher occupancy than the other floors, and so those composters that are serving those floors are getting overloaded. And then we have other composters that aren't being used as much as we anticipated. So now when we're looking at implementing a composting toilet system on future projects, we're looking into providing a composting system that is integrated with a vacuum waste system that allows you to connect your waste streams together and then evenly distribute amongst the composters. Um, since we have a few composters that are being overloaded, we're experiencing excess leachate or liquid issues within the equipment. And we are having to do post-construction modifications to be able to handle that extra amount of leachate. By, if you can see in this main picture, the unit on the right has a larger bar at the bottom and that was installed to be able to have a larger volume of leachate stored within the composter. We also had to install a drain pan on a different unit. Um, another uh, post-construction change that I really recommend you anticipate if you're, you're going to be specifying equipment that's not used for the application <laughs> that it's originally designed for um, is that we specified toilets that were still being developed because they hadn't been used in an office environment before. And when we went for, through construction, they ended up being 18 months behind schedule. And so we had to open the building with different toilets installed that used about two cups of water. And while as these toilets that we specified became available, we had to switch them out because these ones used two tablespoons of water. The next system we're gonna go over is the gray water system. This system is, uh, collects the gray water on site and um, treats it for groundwater recharge that, and that enables 60% of the on-site wastewater to return to the ecosystem. The gray water from the fixtures that are not the composting toilets or the waterless urinals, but it does include the kitchen sinks and the dishwashers and mop sinks within this building are all routed to a 500 gallon uh, day tank located in the basement. From this tank, it is pumped up to constructed wetlands on level three and the, the wetlands is where the treatment process happens. The water is cycled through these wetlands and until, until it gets to a, a treated level and then it is routed down to uh, infiltration planters located at grade. These planters were incorporated into a building, into the building, so they're prominent aspects of it. They're proudly displayed and I think it is a great example of integrated building design where challenges can become opportunities. We had a number of lessons learned for this system as well. The first one was that if you do not have an oxygenated tank, the tank needs to be able to fully drain every day. When we, our first tank that was installed sat on the basement level slab and it wasn't able to fully drain. And so you had a small level of water at the bottom of the tank that was stagnant and it turned septic. We ended up having to rip out that tank and install a new tank, which is this silver box here that is slightly elevated and that allows us to fully drain the tank every day. The second is that you want to be able to filter down uh, to a smaller particle size than the holes within your percolation pipe within the wetland. The system was originally installed with a filter that treated down to a sixteenth of an inch and the percolation piping in the wetlands 
had holes that were a sixteenth of an inch, and they, these holes got clogged. So we ended up replacing this piping with holes, piping that had holes that were slightly larger. The last lesson learned was in regards to permitting. There was no permitting plan for, uh, or permitting process for a gray water system in Seattle at this time. And we worked with the agency and determined that the permitting would be based off concentration. And as we have monitored the water quality within the gray water system, we learned that concentration levels rise during the summer due to evaporation. So we went back to the city and changed our permitting process to now be based off of total count instead of concentration. The last system is the potable rainwater system. The rainwater is collected from an expansive 7,000 square foot solar array on top of the building. And then it is routed to a 56,000 gallon cistern located in the basement. Through, from the cistern, it is routed through a treatment train that consists of ultra filters, UV, and a chlorination system. It's stored in a 500 gallon day tank. And then it is routed to the fixtures within the building. Right now, the Bullet Center is not permitted to be able to use it for potable water reuse, and so it's only being routed to the non-potable uh, fixtures within the building. A major component of the rainwater design has been the regulatory process, and it has been a challenge we have faced for all three of our systems. Each system had a different code governing agency that we had to go through for the permitting process. And for the rainwater system, since it was trying to be reused within the building for potable water use, we ended up getting all the way up to the federal level and we had to meet the EPA's Safe Drinking Water Act. And this is actually requiring the Bullet Center become its own water district. So the lessons learned and the biggest lessons learned we learned from the rainwater system is anticipate a long regulatory process if you are trying to reuse uh, treated water on site for potable water reuse. Um, it has been five years since this building has been operational and we are still working on getting that permit. We are currently in a two and a half month long testing process and fingers crossed by the end of that process we will have our permit for potable water reuse. The second is, whenever possible, work with your reviewer as soon as possible within the design of the project. This allows you to get their feedback of what their requirements are going to be, and you can incorporate that into the design as early on in the process and get that all coordinated. And then lastly, we're learning that it's very likely, at least for a while, that if you are trying to use potable water re reuse on site, that your city will require you to become a water district. Now we're going to look at the actual performance of how the bullet center and the water usage. We, this graph is based off of the 2017 measured water data and it, we found that it's using an average of 1200 gallons per week and this is 85% less than a typical office building. Um, this graph shows that the non-potable water use is pretty aligned to what we're anticipating, but the potable water use, which is the predicted amount is this line at the top, is significantly less than what we were anticipating. And we found that that was because of our assumptions for uh, shower use on site. We assumed that 25% of the full-time occupants would be showering daily at the building and we we're just not seeing that usage pattern. The second thing monitored is the rainwater cistern levels. And the general volume of the cistern is about where we were anticipating it. We never really saw any large or significant drops in the level of the cistern, so we'll be able to meet our, our, non, our potable water demands within the building. But an interesting thing we found was that in the winter months, we are continuing to see the cistern levels drop, and you would anticipate, based off heavier rainfall rates in those months, that the cistern level would rise. Luckily, this is something that the building engineers noticed as well, and they were able to go and look at the system and found that the inlet filter was clogged, so they were able to clean it, and now we are having the cistern fill again. The last water data that is measured for the building is the gray water influent and effluent uh, levels. And an unexpected finding we found was that for the permit, 
we need to be around 1,000 coliform units on average per year. Uh, and in February, we had this high spike of coliform units, so about 2,000. And again, luckily, since this water, er, data is monitored, the building engineers found this and were able to modify that how often the water is pumped from the day tank up to the wetlands. And it used to be every 10 minutes, they increased it to every five, and now we have coliform levels back within permitting range. So the main, I wanted to so end it with a summary of our main lessons learned and how it kind of, they apply to all the different systems within the building. The first is project scale. This applies to both the composting toilets and the rainwater system. For the composting, we were, ended up installing a system that really is not designed and is too small for the system of the building and that has led to some construction changes and maintenance issues. For the potable rainwater system, we're able to save about 1,000 gallons of potable water per week with the system, but it's requiring us to become a water district. So that really needs to be evaluated if that is a strong goal and, and if that works with your project scale. The second is regulatory challenges. This was, I talked about with both gray water and rainwater treatment, and we're still, it's a still a large, big hurdle that we're having for the potable rainwater system. Then lastly, and I think most importantly, is so things that encompass all three of the systems, and that would be owner buy-in. For an innovative project like this, is it, it's extremely important to have your owner on board and understanding that you are doing experimental design if you're having a project that's so innovative, and that not all of those exper experiments are going to go as planned, especially the first try, but if you have your owner anticipating that and excited to be on board with you, they want to be going through this journey. Um, and kind of goes hand in hand with that is post-construction modifications should be anticipated. If you're doing an experimental design, things aren't going to go as planned, but if you're monitoring your water data, you will be able to react and make changes as needed. And then lastly, accurate design assumptions can save money. If we were able to more accurately predict our potable water use within the building, we could have potentially had a smaller cistern size and a smaller treatment train. Um, but if I could leave you with one takeaway from this presentation, I would really like it to be that a net zero water building is possible. Yes, it has been a little bit of an uphill battle, and we have fallen a few times along the way, but each time we have fallen, we have learned something, and I'm here today sharing all of these lessons learned with you in hopes that we can all take these lessons and apply it to our next project, and we can continue to push the bar even higher because it's with buildings like the Bullet Center that we are actually truly able to have a positive impact on the planet. So with that, um, I'm going to pass it over to the next presenter, Eric. <coughs> Thank you. Hello? All right. Can you guys hear me? All right. Thank you for all for joining our discussion today uh, regarding case studies uh, and solutions for water conservation and lessons learned uh, for the built environment. My name is Eric Howe, and I've spent the majority, if not all, of my 11-year career uh, thinking about water here in the state of California uh, and how it is connected to our communities, to our businesses, and specifically how those two groups can reuse water. Um, I was fortunate to start my career down in San Diego uh, where there was an initiative to create sustainable and resilient water supplies for the community uh, being involved in Pure Water San Diego, uh, which is tasked with providing over one-third of the community's water portfolio supply through water reuse. Uh, since then, I've done projects in the mining and oil and gas uh, industries, what I call the dark days. Um, <laughs> I've done work in the brewery space doing water reuse, what I call the dark beer days. Uh, and now I'm working with NSU, uh, where we're working on projects here in the Bay Area, out of our Bay Area office, uh, such as Microsoft and Hunters Point Shipyard. Um, a quick background on NSU. Um, so our company, we provide uh, sustainable, resilient, and cost-effective water reuse solutions through a turnkey design, build, and operate uh, service platform. We take the risk and responsibility for the systems we design, and then we guarantee the performance of those systems through our ongoing operation. 
Uh, we also have a long history in utility ownership and asset management, which has allowed us to invest in some of these projects, um, which has been a great fit for owners who want to uh, realize the sustainability benefits, resiliency benefits, but maybe have uh, capital constraints where they're looking for financing solutions. Uh, we've been in the business for 30 years, uh, and in that time we've designed, built, and currently operate over 210 systems across the USA and Canada. Um, and our team consists of around 125 employees. Uh, that's our licensed engineers, project managers, construction managers, and of course the lifeblood of our company is our operations team. Um, we've provided, been provided the opportunity to speak here today. Um, and as some of the new buildings are topping out here in the city uh, and coming online, you're starting to hear more and more about the many advancements that these buildings have adopted to address sustainability and resiliency challenges. Um, and one such uh, technology is the incorporation of in-building water reuse systems, commonly referred to as on-site water reuse or decentralized water reuse. Uh, and so we thought that it would be uh, great to talk about um, one of the districts that really helped pioneer this approach um, on the eastern side of the country, um, Battery Park City. So um, we're going to talk about Battery Park City. We'll talk about one of the specific projects within uh, the district system design considerations and challenges and lessons learned. Um, so for those who are not familiar, Battery Park City is a 92-acre redevelopment district uh, in Lower Manhattan, just adjacent to the financial district. Uh, they adopted the mission for sustainable redevelopment uh, in this area. And so dating back to the late 90s, as new projects and new buildings were going up, um, developers were tasked with meeting the most stringent uh, sustainability standards at the time, mostly modeled after the USGBC program. Uh, this opened the door to innovation at a whole new scale, uh, where NSU and the developers, we were able to design and build the first uh, in-building water reuse system for a residential high-rise at the Solaire building. Uh, fast forward 15 years, you know, we still operate the system at the Solaire, uh, and our services in Battery Park City alone have expanded to eight different buildings in the district. On the right, we have uh, a map of the district, uh, Battery Park City, um, and in red, you can see the various installations uh, that we've completed. Um, what do each of these systems have in common? Um, each building is collecting all the combined wastewater streams, so that's their black water wastewater stream from these residential apartment buildings, uh, and they are processing that water on site and delivering that back to the building for beneficial uses. Uh, the net result of the district is we're now capable of supplying over 61 million gallons per year of renewable water sources for the district and are servicing over 2,000 resident uh, dwelling units in doing so. So that's the quick overview. And what I'd like to do is give a little bit of a deep dive into one specific uh, project, the Solaire Buildings, uh, where we can talk about results, our lessons learned, and how NSU continues to enhance our service delivery to improve sustainability benefits and reduce the costs for operating these systems. Uh, so starting in the late 90s, the project was designed to treat black water and provide non-potable water for each of the 293 residents. Um, the project incorporates a 25,000 gallon a day uh, in-building black water system, which serves non-potable water for toilet flushing, for cooling tower use, and for irrigation and sidewalk washing. Uh, water reuse was a key strategy which enabled the developer to obtain LEED Gold in 2003 and recertify the building as LEED Platinum in 2009. Uh, first flush for the Solaire took place in 2003 and data collected since that time indicates that we've been able to achieve a 48% reduction in potable water use and a 60% reduction in terms of sewer discharge. So with that, I'd like to give you a little bit of background in terms of how we developed the project. Um, and so the first step for any project is to create a water balance. Um, the goal of a water balance is to define the flow of water in all manners uh, and capture the various inputs of chemicals and energy along the way. Uh, to do this, we first look at the demographics of the building or the development, um, whether that's a district, uh, in terms of number of units, average occupancy, type of fixtures, uh, gross square footage, and within that we'll look at the various use types, whether that's residential, office, uh, commercial, because they all have different wastewater 
and, and non-potable demand for, for, or profiles. Uh, we use this information to create a projection for the total amount of wastewater that will be generated on site or wastewater supply. And then we compare that projection to a projection for the non-potable and potable demands uh, for water on site. Um, again, those non-potable demands consist of water for cooling tower use. Is that all just the meters that are Yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll get to that here a little bit at the end and we'll open the floor to questions. Um, so, uh, sorry. So again, non-potable demands consist of toilet flushing, uh, cooling tower use. Uh, in 2010, they approved the use of laundry uh, and then irrigation for any green space, whether that's green roofs uh, or surrounding park area. Um, again, the graph here is showing the demand profile for the Solaire uh, is typical of a building in Battery Park City. Uh, and what you see is that there are peak usages in the you know, warmer summer months due to increased demand in the cooling towers. So our approach to designing these systems varies from region to region. Uh, in San Francisco, we consider both gray water and black water systems and we evaluate the life cycle costs of each. On one hand, you have gray water systems which uh, are trip, uh, typically treating lower organic strength wastewater and hence require slightly less surface area in terms of area use within the building. Uh, these systems do require dual collection systems or an additional plumbing riser to separate black water and gray water sources, uh, which typically results in higher first costs for the integrated system into the building once you consider uh, plumbing at the high rise scale. On the other hand, black water systems treat the combined wastewater uh, and in areas like San Francisco where our water and sewer rates are very high, uh, they, they represent a higher potential for water reuse and can uh, represent a higher value to the client. Um, however, in San Francisco, black water systems do require um, additional sampling when compared to gray water systems, which drives up the operating costs for black water systems when compared to gray water systems. Um, for smaller systems, gray water is a great fit, but as you increase the capacity of those systems, you eventually reach a tipping point where black water systems may become a greater value. Uh, and that's because those operating costs are due to sampling and those sampling costs are fixed regardless of how many gallons per day you're treating. So as you treat more gallons, you're effectively spreading that cost over more gallons and driving down your cost per gallon treated. Um, in New York City, there's no difference between black water and gray water operational requirements. Um, and so for these specific projects, um, Blackwater was the decision to, uh, due to the avoided cost for triple plumbing. Um, as we look at technology, we will typically evaluate the opportunity to use more biophilic elements through wetland type treatment systems and compare that to more space effective systems such as membrane bioreactors. Uh, we work with a range of technology and as you can see, most of our projects have been membrane bioreactors, but um, we've worked with a range of other technologies as well. Um, so again, no surprise, since we're talking about real estate in Manhattan, the system selected was a membrane bioreactor. Uh, we then can figure, figure out the best way to integrate these systems into the building. Um, and essentially you have two options if, once you've decided on a membrane bioreactor. You have the option to use a pre-assembled or packaged system that's um, assembled off-site, shipped to the project site and is installed kind of think plug and play. Uh, and then you also have the opportunity to site construct these systems. Uh, under this model, the process tanks are cast in place, built into the building foundation. Uh, they're covered and then equipment is simply stacked on top of those process tanks, uh, which is a very creative way to reduce the overall footprint uh, for these systems. <coughs> um, again, if space is a, a significant consideration or if on-site water reuse is being considered late into the design phase for the project, there's a need for more flexibility, so site constructing adds value uh, in that regard. So this graphic gives a really quick kind of like process flow for these on-site systems. It shows how uh, the wastewater sources are collected on the left. You have your shower, bath, and laundry, or your gray water, uh, your kitchen waste and toilets, black water, in the context of um, Battery Park City, these sources are combined. They're sent to a feed tank where those flows are buffered and equalized. 
Um, and what you'll see is that there's a connection to the city sewer from that tank. So we're not always treating 100% of the water on site. There is a need for additional sewer service. Uh, and basically, quite simply, water enters that tank and then overflows to the city sewer as it is uh, unneeded for the treatment process. Uh, once entering the treatment process, consists of a number of process components, fine screening, biological, and treat, biological, biological treatment, uh, membrane filtration, making up your MBR, or membrane bioreactor, and then from there it goes to UV and ozone for disinfection and color removal, and then you have the option to add chlorine for residual disinfection uh, of the plumbing systems. Um, we store that water in a tank, which is also provided with backup municipal supply in the event that the uh, system is down for maintenance. Um, and one important step is prior to taking that treated water and putting it back into the building for beneficial uses, uh, we extract waste heat from that wastewater process. And we'll get into that here a little bit, but that's a great opportunity that we um, are working with and uh, recommend to reduce the energy use of these systems. Um, for those wondering what these systems look like and how they integrate into a building, uh, the diagram here shows that um, these systems typically are existing in some deep, dark recess of your building. Uh, item F kind of outlines the wastewater system here at the Solaire. Um, and if we zoom in a little bit, um, this is an image of that process equipment area. Um, so again, the tanks are cast in place. What you can see here as outlined in the safety yellow, those are access hatches. And inside those access hatches, that's actually the process tank where we have aeration equipment and membranes. If you look overhead, you'll see the, the beam. That's a, uh, a hoist for pulling membranes out of those process uh, tanks. In the foreground, you have your pumps uh, for pulling permeate through the membranes, for circulation throughout the process. And then in the distance, you can see uh, the blowers, which are actually stacked on top another of another one of the tanks for the system. Um, you know, this is our, uh, w the first in-building system for a, a, a residential high-rise. So we've learned a lot along the way. A 25,000 gallon system that has been delivered in under 2,000 square feet for this particular application. Um, in terms of water quality requirements, um, the table at the top shows the various parameters uh, that are to be monitored and the effluent water quality guidelines as stated by the New York Department of Buildings. Uh, the table below uh, shows the water quality results from a number of our installations in Battery Park City. Um, these systems are monitored continuously for turbidity and pH, and then the remainder of the constituents are sampled via grab samples on a monthly basis. Um, looking at the data, you can see how these systems are providing sufficient treatment to meet the various water quality requirements uh, in New York City, which are similar here in San Francisco. Um, you know, there are some that raise concern regarding the reliability of performance and the protection of public health for decentralized systems. And we feel that, you know, the proof of concept is really in the data. We have 15 years of data uh, that show zero permit violations, zero public health concerns, uh, zero user complaints. No complaints for odor, no complaints for color or unwanted color in, you know, the, the pristine toilet bowls. So. Um, Throughout the development of, the, uh, of Battery Park City, uh, back in 2009, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, or NYSERDA, contracted NSU to conduct a study, which was completed in collaboration with the developer, Albanese organization, uh, with American Water, and with Chemtreat, who was managing the building, heating, and cooling systems. Uh, the goals of the study were to understand the cost benefit of the water system, uh, study opportunities to maximize water and cooling tower uses. Uh, at the time, we were only using a 50-50 blend due to concerns raised by your NALCOs and your chemtreats. Uh, we were also monitoring power consumption of this system, um, and we'll get into all these a little bit in a second. Uh, we were going to compare the water energy use of the building with the water reuse system to one without a baseline building, and then recommend modifications to improve the energy performance of these installed systems. Uh, we're running a little bit short on time, so I can't provide you uh, all the details of the two-year, 122-page study, um, but if you'd like, uh, I have all that available at my fingertips, and I'd be happy to share with you if you contact me after uh, the presentation here. Uh, so the first step to understand the energy use of these systems, uh, the study team installed 
uh, power meters on all of the various power supplies to the various uh, process treatment components. Uh, pretty simple, collect data, analyze data, and in doing so, we learned a lot about the energy profiles for these systems, uh, which actually enabled us to develop operational best practices to drive down the energy requirements by anywhere from 10 to 35 percent. Um, as you can see from this diagram, process aeration is the major energy consumer here, um, followed by the booster pump, actually, which is required independent of whether you're using water reuse or not in New York City, given that you need to pump water up into the house tanks uh, within the building. Um, you also then have, um, you know, followed by that, your next big users are for disinfection. Uh, you have ozone, UV, and, and also for odor control. Um, buildings use a tremendous amount of energy for water heating. Uh, depending on where you are, that number can be as high as 30 percent. Um, and that energy typically is going down the heat, uh, down the, the sewer in, in the form of waste heat. Uh, and in the con context of a building with on-site water reuse integrated, about 5 percent of a building's energy demand is uh, dedicated to powering the process treatment equipment. Um, in the context, again, of Solaire, or one of these high rises in Battery Park City, uh, that's around 350 kilowatt hours per day for that 20, 25,000 gallon a day system. Um, there's a tremendous amount of embedded energy in all of that wastewater, um, again, due to the addition of heat <coughs> through processes like laundry and processes like shower uses uh, within the buildings. Um, that amount of heat is around four times the amount of energy actually needed for treatment. And so by integrating a thermal energy recovery system into the building, uh, we are now able to recover a large fraction of that waste heat and provide that back to the building, uh, essentially preheating boilers, which allow us to demonstrate a net zero or even net energy positive uh, on-site water reuse system at the high-rise scale or larger. Um, so how does this work? It's, it's relatively simple. Um, we simply, we treat the water, we put it in a tank, we put a heat exchanger in that tank where we extract 10 to 20 degrees F of waste heat. Um, we transfer that heat into the incoming potable supply via heat pump, uh, incoming potable supply to the boiler system, effectively preheating boilers. Um, the benefit there is we're able to reduce um, boiler natural gas use by around 65,000 BTUs per hour at this particular scale. Um, that results, you know, if you pencil it out, that's around 400 kilowatt hour per day uh, energy benefit. Um, another important result of the NYSERDA study was, was the water quality analyses performed by Chemtree. Um, again, when we started the project, there were concerns by the building uh, cooling tower managers. They only wanted to use 50 percent of the reused water. So uh, to address these concerns, the study performed water quality analyses, which included pH, conductivity, uh, concentrations of total hardness, calcium hardness, magnesium, phosphates, a range of other constituents associated with fouling and corrosion in, in heating systems and cooling systems. Uh, corrosion coupons were, uh, corrosion coupon tests were performed and the initial results actually showed that there was corrosion uh, taking place on these uh, test coupons uh, and the reason for that was the accumulation of chlorides in the closed loop water, non-potable water reuse uh, network. Uh, this was caused by the continuous addition of chlorine or sodium hypochlorite uh, into the non-potable water. And so to address this problem, we implemented an operational program which reduced the use of chemicals, basically intermittently chlorinating um, as needed to maintain and address Legionella concerns in within the building plumbing supply. The benefit to NSU is we now have firm guidelines from our cooling tower uh, for cooling tower makeup that um, have been developed in uh, partnership with Chemtreat. Um, you know, roughly that's 800 micromoles in terms of conductivity, pH below 7.5, and keeping your chlorides below 100 milligrams per liter. Um, we learned a lot about resiliency benefits for these on-site systems, these smaller on-site systems through storm, event, storm events that took place in the area. Uh, back in 2012, uh, Superstorm Sandy hit. Uh, we had over 80 systems in the Eastern Corridor that were directly affected by Superstorm Sandy. Um, at the time, you had centralized treatment plants that were down for weeks and weeks 
discharging untreated wastewater into surface waters. Uh, and throughout that storm event, not one of our 80 systems uh, went down. We, every one of those systems remained in compliance. Uh, no violations for effluent permits um, throughout that entire storm event. Um, so in summary, uh, Battery Park City, we've got six different buildings, uh, in-building systems, size between 50 and 40,000 gallons a day, serving eight different buildings within the district. Uh, 2,000 residents who are now capable of using up to 160,000 gallons a day of reclaimed water. 15 years of operating data, zero permanent exceedances, zero user complaints. Um, we're achieving 48% reduction in water use, 60% reduction in sewer di discharge. We're now capable of reusing or using 100% reclaimed water for cooling tower makeup and for laundry. Um, we've shown how these systems can achieve net zero and net energy positive implementations. Uh, and then there's a range of benefits to the community in terms of reducing the strain on municipal and centralized infrastructure and delaying uh, needed upgrades, uh, reducing environmental impacts due to combined sewer overflows by reducing the amount of wastewater that's going down the drain, um, and then improving resiliency in water treatment and water supply uh, for the community. You know, our water challenges in California and the arid west um, are nothing if not broad. Our water supplies are under constant pressure um, from climate change, persistent drought conditions, uh, and increasing populations. And we can't control how much and when rain will fall, but we can control how we reuse water. And we feel that education is really the key there, and integrating water reuse into the built environment will spur residents Spill, will spur office employees to think about their connection to water um, and hopefully think about a different way uh, for the future. So with that, I think we'll open it up to questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you both. Uh, yeah, so we'll open it up to questions. I'll run around here with some mics. Um, make sure, please speak your question into the mic. Yeah, hi. <coughs> question for Erica about the composting toilets. Uh, what, what is the reason that each toilet needs its own pipe, is that because of the units you were using, or is there a yeah, better reason? It's, it's because there's no water, sorry, that one should be on. Okay, yeah, um, it's because there's no water with the flush, really, it's just a small uh, coat of foam, so it has to go directly <coughs> with gravity. Also, each composter has a small fan on it, and the way the aerobic process works is it brings the air through the fixtures into the composters. Um, so it's just the way the systems are designed. The way to avoid that is to have a vacuum waste system with it, which uses more energy, which is part of the reason why that wasn't originally selected, because we thought these systems would work without the issues that we were finding on it. So. Uh, thank you. Um, two quick questions. One is, I, I think, Eric, you touched on it, but justifying the capital costs and the OM on M cost, Erica. That sounds like that would that'd be a hard sell when with an owner. And then uh, the follow-up question is: is source control of uh, again, Eric? You touched on it, but uh, one of the issues is there's a lot of chemicals in water source, even from the rainfall, mm -hmm. um, that have not traditionally been tracked. And is there any tracking mechanisms for those? No. Uh, yeah. So for on the owner's cost, it, that's why. Bec water costs are just not very high, so the payback on systems like this is always a difficult struggle. Um, and so if you have an owner who's wanting to implement a system like this for other reasons, for the sustainability reasons, and to show that we can do a project like this, it, you always try to mitigate it and make the cost as less, the least small as possible. Um, also, with San Francisco, with the now the non-potable water ordinance, it's becoming mandatory, so we're trying to find systems that work the best for each system and as cost-effective as possible. Yeah, and in terms of, for, for your follow-up question, in terms of, you know, tracking of chemical constituents, um, you know, what I can say, I don't know what you're referring to exactly, but um, in terms of constituents of concern, but... Sure, so, you know, I, what I can say is that uh, in the implementation of these systems, you know, public health concerns are priority number one. And robust, very robust studies have been um, conducted to analyze the impact to public health. Uh, and all the regulations that have been established are reflective of the learning taking place there. Uh, my question is for Erica. Um, at this point, is there now a composting toilet that exists on the market 
that would better serve your your original purposes? Yeah. So there are the the actual toilet fixture. There is that design now. It kind of was produced right as after we finished construction. And there's two different companies. We used uh, Phoenix, and that's what's installed on these projects. And then there's also I believe Clibus. And so they both have the composter that, but you have to install exactly their fixture with their system. You can't use a Phoenix system or fixture on a, like a Clibus composter. They won't allow that. Ready? Howdy. So I've actually one of the few, I don't know how many people have been to the Environmental Innovation Center in San Jose and then also been to the Bullet Center. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that the, I don't know, uh, it really makes a huge difference. The Phoenix seems to be working much better because with the vacuum and all that stuff. Because when you go, has anybody been to the EIC in San Jose? Yeah. I don't know, in the mail, in the mail restrooms it stinks, so it doesn't work as well. They have the composting toilets oh, as well. Oh, okay. So I, I'm sorry, that's, that's the comparison. I was able to see the Phoenix versus the Clivus. Yeah, and I think that <laughs> that was like a really cool thing about Bullet that I don't know if you thought about a lot or how much time you spent, but it seems like things were just done, specified and done better at the Bullet versus the EIC. Not that I, I love both, but I'm just saying. So. Okay. Yeah, so the system is operating how we want. There's been issues with the maintenance of it, and there's little things that aren't quite what we had anticipated, but the primary function is doing exactly what we wanted to do with reducing the water by the 96% and there is no odor. We have had no issues with odor. It's operating how we want it to. Uh, two questions. Um, do you have NSF 350 certification for this? Is that something like in LA that's National Sanitation Foundation? That's what you have, for, have to have for uh, recycling systems. And then the other is for um, uh, catching uh, storm events, do you have a system for that or does this also con uh, collect storm, storm water? So storm water is a case-by-case -case basis. These systems in Battery Park City did not integrate storm water, but that is a potential opportunity to integrate. And in terms of NSF 350, I believe that's um, a requirement for a lot of the membranes and, and treatment technologies for validated purposes, if I'm not mistaken. So, so uh, yeah, normally it's at a Correct. So each of those technologies is rated as NSF 350. So we're not a technology provider. We don't manufacture the systems. We will look at the available technologies on the market and make recommendations and integrate that. We're more or less integrators of those technologies. This is really a question for both of you. I'm interested in your opinions on the feasibility of retrofitting any of these systems into existing structures. You want to go first? Sure. Um, I would say for a composting toilet system, it would be extremely difficult because you needed to have a straight stack to the basement and have space for it. Um, and a lot of just n typical office buildings, unless you're designing with that system in mind in the very beginning, it would be very difficult for a retrofit. If you do a vacuum waste and combined with the uh, composting, it would definitely be feasible. And then for the gray water and the rainwater, I definitely see how that could be incorporated within uh, a retrofit. It would just be finding the space for either the constructed wetlands or if you went with an MBR system. It's always just finding space within the building, but the other systems are much more flexible than a composting system. Yeah, to add to that, it's a you know great point. And to add to the space constraint for us, it's about the existing infrastructure within the building. You know, if that building is dual plumbed and has a way to provide that non-potable water that's treated on site, then there's an opportunity, assuming we have space. Uh, and then within that, you know, I've seen retrofits take place. It's just a matter of kind of considering a few of these constraints. Mm -hmm. It's never the easiest process, but with a little bit of creativity, you can make it happen. This one is for Eric. Uh, with the uh, buildings in New York, <coughs> if you could give me an idea, I, I saw that you, or well, heard that you have your own team of operators. If you could give me a sense of how much time in a man hour day an operator is working in one of those buildings, and also what, it, what does New York require in terms of licensing for these operators for these distributed systems? Sure. So in terms of man hour requirements or labor requirements, our operators on site two times per week for roughly four hours a day. Mm -hmm. So in total, around eight hours a week. Um, within that, we're doing our sampling on a monthly basis for the various constituents we need to report on. Um, in response to the operator grade requirements, I believe those are 
they're, they're all, they must be state licensed operators, and I believe the requirement's a grade two uh, for these systems in Battery Park City, which, which is equivalent exactly to here in California. Any other questions? No? All right, well, thank you all both very much for participating. <laughs>